We have uh, Mike Flanagan. Mike is a VP and GM for Cisco's data and analytics group. Mike is responsible for all the company's uh, BI and analytics and data strategies. He leads multiple business units, so we'll get a quick read on the market from him. Mike? Good morning. All right, now I'm one of those annoying speakers who's going to insist on some audience participation. Uh, so if you're, uh, if you're busy answering your email, uh, maybe I can ask you for just a second. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you know what the IoT is? Nobody wants to say no, so everybody raises their hand. Raise your hand if you think you could explain it to my grandmother during an elevator ride. Fewer hands, right? Um, so one of the things that I find when we talk about IoT is that I can make it almost anything I want it to be. Um, how about my Fitbit? How many, how many of you think that that's IoT? Okay. How about uh, the Wi-Fi access points uh, that, are, that are here in the hotel giving you internet access? How many think that's IoT? I don't know, let's explore that for a little bit and we'll see, if we, uh, we'll see if we can come to some sort of understanding by the end of the session about what exactly is IoT. Uh, I, I will relay just this one story uh, about how uh, IoT is, uh, is touching my, my personal life. My uh, better half is a lawyer and she's involved in a case that I know nothing about because of uh, all of her confidentiality requirements, but every once in a while she'll ask me these strange questions that lead me to believe that the companies that are involved have something to do with connecting things. Uh, and so she asked me the other day, what is IoT? I said, well, why, why do you want to know? What, is there some context? Well, I can't tell you, just what, what is IoT? Okay. Um, and we talked about it for 15 or 20 minutes, which uh, was not exactly how I'd planned to spend the evening, but at any rate, uh, 15 minutes later, what I finally settled on was it's many things, but what it is that everyone seems to be able to agree on is damn good marketing. <laughs> really good marketing, and everybody can, can sort of agree. So why has IoT gotten its own name? Uh, we didn't give the Internet of Desktop Computers the name Internet of Desktops. We didn't call the Internet of Tablets the Internet of Tablets. We, you know, once you started connecting your, your, your mobile devices, we didn't call it the Internet of iPhones. So why do we call it the Internet of Things? Um, and, and I think that it, it really is, if you come back to it, it's this digital disruption that's happening as we start bringing things online that nobody really ever envisioned would be connected. Um, I'm pretty sure that the guys who work at Exxon and Chevron and uh, Shell never envisioned that they would be connecting their offshore drilling operations to the network. I, I don't think that that was how it was designed. Um, and so they needed some name for it that was very catchy and very specific. But the thing that they're all finding, regardless of whether it's something that's pretty obvious, like our Fitbits being connected, whether it's uh, you know, what we're doing with, uh, with manufacturing operations, what we're doing with offshore drilling, uh, there's no question that there is some level of disruption that's happening as we start connecting things that we didn't previously envision being connected. Um, and on the one hand, that's producing an incredible amount of opportunity. Uh, I'll talk about an oil and gas use case with, the, with one of our customers here in a little bit, uh, where they really believe that they have the opportunity to extend the useful life of every well that they drill by one to three years. Now you think about uh, with what's happening to the price of oil right now and the relatively high cost of oil exploration, how much value there is for them in being able to extend the useful life of those wells that they've already drilled by another one to three years. It's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, the question uh, is not whether or not disruption is being created. The question is whether you're gonna be on the good, good end of that disruption or the bad end of that disruption. Because if you happen to be one of the companies that leases drilling platforms to the big oil and gas players, that's a terrible thing for you. You don't want them to get one to three more years because you need your rigs to be out drilling and you need your, your, your equipment to be working. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there, there's a disrupted side and a disruptor side as we get connected. Um, and I guess if you're on either side of that, it's probably something that, that you're able to take advantage of one way or another. Uh, the more concerning part though for me is that there are so many places where there's an opportunity for disruption that disruption is not happening. Let's talk about that for a second. Uh, so I, I just heard Boris, and I promise we didn't coordinate this ahead of time. 
talk about people being the biggest challenge in, in BI. Uh, we have a slightly different view of where the biggest problem is in terms of getting value from IoT projects. Um, so I'm gonna ask just a, one more quick show of hands. How many in here in your company have some project going on right now with IoT? Keep your hands up high for me. Um, keep your hands up if you know for sure that you're going to get value from that project at the end. Right. Most of us start putting our hands down because we, we kind of think so and we hope so and some of our jobs depend on it. <laughs> but we're not totally sure. So we asked 1,300 of our customers at Cisco, what is the number one challenge that you're having if you didn't keep your hand up high? Why is it that you invested in this project, but you don't think you're sure that you're going to get some value out? Um, and of course, people are a part of that, you know, getting, getting workers to be willing to share their data and, um, and, and the things themselves, just how do I get something connected? The life cycle uh, in auto manufacturing from the time that I have a great idea of doing something in the car to the time that it's actually in the car, historically it's been about 10 years. And so sometimes just connecting the things are, are, are the challenge. But 40% of the customers that we surveyed said the number one problem that they have with getting value out of IoT projects is data. Now Boris and I may be able to come to some agreement that part of the data challenge is getting the people to give you the data. Um, but if you can't figure out how to get access to the data that you need, or more likely in these IoT projects, you're getting access to so much data and you just don't have the right processes for dealing with it to get insight, actionable insight from the data, then it turns into this great exercise in connecting things, but not being able to get any value out. And that really is, uh, that, that really is a, a terrible situation to be in. Um, but even if you're able to effectively capture and process and analyze and get insight from data, there's another 27% of our customers who have an entirely different problem. Right? They may be in that quadrant where they have all the right tools and all the right processes to be able to get actionable insight from their data. What they're missing is the ability to link that back into their business process so that they can put that insight into the business process in a way that actually changes something. Imagine how frustrating it would be for that oil and gas customer that I'm going to talk about, I promise, at some point. If they were able to get all the data that told them how to extend the life of a well by three years, but they couldn't figure out how to get that back into their drilling operations so that they were able to take advantage of that. Again, on a more personal note, a couple of years ago, I decided that I was going to start wearing a Fitbit. How many in here have some sort of fitness device that you wear? Uh, biggest problem that I had uh, in my fitness uh, was not counting my steps. Uh, the biggest problem I had, as it turns out, is I know exactly how many steps I'm not taking every day and I don't do anything about it, um, which is why I have the girlish figure that I do. The, the point is, I have plenty of data now. I know exactly how many steps I'm supposed to walk. I know exactly how many steps I'm not walking that I should. And I'm smart enough to figure out that all I have to do is move a little bit, um, but it doesn't seem to happen. And I have all kinds of good excuses for why. It's not about data in this case, it's about process. So data is, is one big chunk of the problem for our customers. The other big chunk is, is turning the insights that they get into something that's actionable and that they actually take action on as part of their business process. Because we um, saw 40% as being the, the, the largest chunk of that pie, we decided to spend a little extra time figuring out what is it about data that's creating such a problem in the Internet of Things. Um, now, I, I joked when I started that you know, we didn't have a, a different name for the Internet of Desktops and Laptops and Tablets. Uh, why do we have a name for IoT? Uh, and if you, if you think a lot about the way that data has been historically created, uh, everybody in here understands uh, what you do with Teradata and your data warehouse. Everybody understands what you do with Hadoop and your data lake. Um, the, the problem isn't when you look at IoT that we don't have ways to capture data, we don't have ways to store data, we don't have ways to explore and analyze data. The biggest difference in IoT from every other thing that we've done with data before is where that data is being created. Uh, because historically, whether it was very structured data that you would, would put into Teradata or whether it was that unstructured kind of data uh, that you might get from uh, your, you know, clickstream data on your website or, or text, uh, typically it was applications in the data center generating large volumes of data, uh, and all you had to do was move it to the next rack of servers over in your data center uh, to put it in your data warehouse uh, or into your data lake, and then you could, could play with it. When we look at IoT, I'm not generating data in the data center by and large. I'm generating data in very remote 
places. And we just don't have the right mechanisms to deal with that. So I'll, I'll talk about this, um, this oil and gas customer quickly. Uh, in this case, uh, this uh, one of the large you know, sort of top five North American oil and gas companies, what they have is uh, a huge amount of offshore drilling operations, right? Oil wells that they drill. Uh, and they tend to have multiple wells that are drilled in one physical location, so the Gulf of Thailand or uh, the Gulf of Mexico, right? They've, they've got a bunch of drills. Um, what's happening way down inside of those uh, wells is important for them to be able to figure out how to maximize the oil that they can extract and uh, to make sure that the, uh, that the well stays viable. And so one of the ways that they're, they're able to get that now with IoT that they weren't able to get before uh, is they have these fiber optic sensors. In this case, they're made by a company called Slixa. And they drop this fiber optic sensor down inside of this oil well. Anybody have a guess at how much data a sensor inside of an oil well generates every 24 hours? Just yell out some numbers. Gigabyte. Terabytes. In verbose mode, 10 terabytes a day of data is generated by this downhole sensor. Anybody know how offshore oil platforms are connected to the data center? Satellite. Right. Roughly two megabit per second. So you can do the math on how long it would take to transmit 24 hours of data back to the data center. It's just not gonna happen. And this is a, this is a different problem, right? So now you start to understand, or at least I start to understand, why data is a big challenge in getting value from this IoT project. The problem isn't the technology to generate data. The problem is that in order to analyze that data, I have to figure out how to get it from where it's generated to where all my analysis happens. That's always been done in my data center. It didn't matter whether I was doing uh, structured data analysis in Teradata or whether I was looking at data that was in my data lake. Uh, I always dealt with that in a very central way, which relied on me being able to move it all. Now I've got a problem. I can move it all by storing it on a hard drive and putting it on a helicopter every week and flying it back to my data center, but perhaps that doesn't get me the real-time insight that I'm hoping for. If I have to make drilling decisions a week in arrears, I'm probably gonna miss something in that time frame. So the only other option is to completely change the way that I think about data analysis. I can no longer consider that the architecture is generate data and move it to a place where I apply analysis. I now have to think about how do I take analysis and move it to where I'm generating data. I, I don't know about your company, but my company doesn't have a data architecture for that today. That's not how we've worked. We don't have analytics that go out to your site and figure out whether or not your router is working correctly and give you information right there at your, your office. Right? We tend to, uh, tend to collect that information and analyze it and then give you some, some insight. So this is a completely different way of thinking about how to deal with their data. Um, and in this case, there are some Cisco assets, and I won't uh, turn this into a commercial for Cisco, uh, but there are some Cisco assets that we applied that look at two things. One is streaming data, so it's the data as it's coming off of these sensors right now uh, one second, three second, five second, you know, kind of, uh, kind of averages and insights. Uh, and then there is a historian database where we're storing a bunch of the historical data uh, because uh, while streaming analytics is really interesting to tell me what's happening in an instant, uh, they're not so good at telling me how this instant looks like the instant from the same day uh, last week. Uh, and so I need what's happening in real time and I need uh, what's happening or what's happened before and I need to be able to pair those together. Then of course I need to be able to tell somebody what to do about it, right? What does it really mean? Um, you guys know how many geologists are actually on an offshore oil well? It's none. Right? How many people are really responsible for making drilling decisions that are on the oil, uh, that are on an offshore platform? It's none. Those people are back at headquarters. Those people are back at a regional office. Um, so not only do I have a problem of needing to be able to get the insight uh, locally, I now need to be able to give that insight in near real time to somebody who's very far away and let them push back down some decisions very quickly about what to do there. Again, not normally how we've, how we've managed this process. Um, and, and so these guys had a huge problem about how to deal with the data that they were getting 
The problem wasn't generating the data. The problem was how do you actually turn all that data that you can now get from IoT into a changed business process that lets you get the outcome that you were looking for. Um, and so for us, it was a combination with this customer of helping them see the possibility of what they could do by changing the way that they thought about their data architecture and the way they thought about their analytics and actually giving them some tools to, to put that into practice. And so as we think about IoT, um, perhaps in hindsight and reflection, it, it may not just be good marketing. It may actually be that there are some fundamental changes that we're gonna have to make to the way that we manage our data for connecting things to the internet that we didn't necessarily have to change just to connect one more device that we uh, have uh, uh, from a mobile phone to a tablet to a, to a laptop. Um, perhaps data really is the, the key difference between connecting things and all the other things that, that, that we've done before uh, to get network connectivity. This particular company is called Mazac. Uh, anybody in here familiar with Mazac? A couple of you. Um, I, I wasn't until we started working with them. <laughs> um, Mazac makes uh, machines for uh, manufacturing. And they have a thing now called the iSmart Factory. And this little uh, thing that the arrow is pointing at is uh, what they call the Mazac Smart Box. And inside that Smart Box uh, is a piece of Cisco hardware uh, called an Industrial Ethernet 4000 switch. Uh, I'm not frankly sure uh, what makes it industrial, but uh, somebody at Cisco knows. Inside of that, uh, we're running streaming analytics software. And uh, while you probably won't be able to uh, see these screenshots very well, uh, what we're doing now is looking at a variety of things that are happening inside of that machine. Spindle vibration, the pH uh, level of, of certain things, uh, at temperature sensors. So there's a bunch of sensors inside of the box. Mazak's contribution to the Internet of Things is that they've added sensors to their equipment. They're not really expecting, though, that they're going to be the ones who give you insight from the data that comes from those sensors. So the problem that they have with data as a, as a company is they know how to create it, but they're not really sure how to, once, it's in, once their machine is installed in your factory, how to help you use it. Um, and so there was a, a, some work that we did with Mazak that helped take that data, and as it was entering their smart box uh, to do some analysis on it in real time uh, that helped the operator of the machine understand what was happening, and more importantly, to draw a trend line and do some predictions about what was likely to happen in the next minute, the next three minutes, the next five minutes uh, with that machine. The operators understand the data once they have it, what to do with it, how to make adjustments to their process. And so what we've seen now is that we, we have sort of the data creator as, as Mazak by putting sensors into their equipment. And we have the data consumers on the other side who understand what all that data means, but what they needed was some way very quickly and right there on the manufacturing floor to get some insight from it. And uh, so, so in this case, putting that streaming analytics capability, putting the ability to do analysis of data in the smart box on the machine really made all the difference because they need to be able to respond to the data that they're getting from this machine in near real time in a way that if they had to move all that data back to the data center or to the cloud where it was analyzed and then push back down some sort of work instruction, by the time that that valid work instruction made it to the person who was operating the machine, it wouldn't matter anymore. They would have already missed the window to incorporate that insight into what they were doing every day. Um, so these guys, in, in, in this case, uh, see the ability to do real-time analytics on data that's at the edge, that they never move back to a data center, they never send to the cloud, they never move to a central location, but they're able to get insight from that data in such a way that they can make real-time decisions on the manufacturing floor about how to operate that machine, and in so doing, get a better result for their business, and that really is, uh, of course, what it's, what it's all about. Uh, I asked earlier how many of you thought that Wi-Fi access points were part of the Internet of Things. The reason for that is we have a, a Fortune 500 company that we work with that's a home builder, and they have 400 uh, what they call welcome centers around the U.S., and uh, you can go into these welcome centers, and if you're building a house in their neighborhood, 
And you can decide things like what kind of flooring might you like to have, what kind of countertops, uh, various uh, options for how to, how to build your home. They had no idea what people were doing in those welcome centers unless they bought a house. Because the only way that they got data from those people was they asked them to fill out a form after they'd already signed on the dotted line to buy their house. Uh, by using Wi-Fi access points and security cameras that they already had installed at the location, but pushing some of the processing of that data out to the edge, we were able to help them get some, some insight into what customers were doing and how they were spending their time. And uh, in, in so doing, uh, we did something that I think is interesting with this customer, um, which is we turned things that were not generally considered IoT into proxy sensors. So Wi-Fi access points could see the mobile devices of the people who were coming in, and they could understand how long were they spending in the, in the facility, um, you know, how many times were they coming in on average before they bought a home or didn't, et cetera. And the security cameras that were used to keep people from breaking into the middle of the night and stealing things, putting some video analytics behind that gave them insight into what were people looking at when they were in the center. Um, and in this case, you know, I think the most uh, interesting uh, thing for us, and I'll leave this as a takeaway with you, is the Internet of Things is not necessarily about sensors. It's not necessarily about connecting sensors. Right? It's about figuring out how to use the data that you're already creating in a lot of cases for a different purpose. Um, and so in this case, uh, you know, we, we were able to help them use security camera data and Wi-Fi data for a purpose they never originally intended, but it gave them some insight that they needed. And it, it wasn't perfect, of course, uh, because uh, they would have gotten much better data if they'd been able to sensor enable everything. But um, you know, it, was, it was the opportunity to get some better insight. And in the end, it really is all about how to use that data that you have to get that insight to help you adjust a business process so that you get a better outcome. And. Um, that's all I have. I think I'm just about out of time, but uh, if there are a question or two, I'm happy to take them.